Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the second annual Women in Medicine Transforming Healthcare Lecture. I'm Dr. Nicole Sundu, a board certified internist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, past president of the American Medical Women's Association and chair of the AMWA Leadership Council. We're gathering today during Women in Medicine Month to honor women physicians, promote the history of their contributions and to inspire physicians, physicians in training and those interested in becoming physicians. This lecture series is a collaboration of the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation and the American Medical Women's Association. And today's panel discussion is about leadership. The mission of the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation is to preserve and promote the history of women in medicine for the purpose of impacting the present and future of healthcare and the profession for women. The mission of AMWA is to advance women in medicine, advocate for equity, and to ensure excellence in healthcare. Both organizations clearly see the special role that women in medicine have had and continue to have in transforming healthcare. Before we begin, I would like to thank those who made this lecture series possible. The Leadership Council of the American Medical Women's Association, Gabby Benson, Executive Director of the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation, the Foundation Board of Directors, Eliza Lochin, MD, MPH, Executive Director of the American Medical Women's Association, and Connie Newman, MD, member of the Board of Directors of the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation and past president of the American Medical Women's Association. I also want to thank our sponsors for this evening's event, AMWA's Leadership Council, Drs. Douglas and Eliza Chin, Dr. Danielle Larocque Arena and Dr. Luigi Arena, Dr. Connie Newman, with promotional support by the American Medical Women's International Association. We have two accomplished and distinguished physicians with us this evening to speak with us today on the topic of leadership, Dr. Karen Nichols and Dr. Danielle Larock Arena. The moderator of this discussion, Dr. Teresa Rohr Kirchgraber, is another distinguished physician, a professor of clinical medicine at the Augusta University, University of Georgia Medical Partnership, and president emeritus of the American Medical Women's Association. I'd like to hand the floor over now to Dr. Roy Kirchgraber to introduce our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Sandu. Well, it is going to be an amazing night. And let me introduce you to our speakers. Dr. Nichols is an international speaker and consultant on principles of leadership and end of life care. She's the author of Physician Leadership, the 11 skills that every doctor needs to be an effective leader. Dr. Nichols started her medical career in private practice in internal medicine and geriatrics in Mesa, Arizona. She held key roles in Midwestern University, Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine, including assistant dean and division director of internal medicine. In 2002, she was appointed dean of Midwestern University, Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine, and served as dean until 2018. During her tenure, she also served as a president of the American Osteopathic Association from 2010 to 2011. Dr. Nichols was the first woman president of three osteopathic organizations, the American Osteopathic Association, the Arizona Osteopathic Medical Association, the American College of Osteopathic Internists. Additionally, she was one of the first four DOs select, elected to the Board of the Accreditation Council for graduate medical education, eventually serving as chair from 2020 to 2022. And if that isn't enough, Dr. Nichols's contributions have been recognized with top awards from the American Osteopathic Association and the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine, including the Distinguished Service Award and the Christner Award. Other prestigious awards include the Arizona Osteopathic Medical Association Physician of the Year, the Illinois Osteopathic Medical Society Physician of the Year Award, and the Kansas City University College of Osteopathic Medicine Alumni of the Year Award. In 2014, Dr. Nichols was a recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Arizona Osteopathic Medical Association. And if that's not enough, she holds a total of nine honorary degrees in recognition of her exceptional achievements. Dr. Danielle LaRoque Arena. She is a prolific and renowned pediatrician and child abuse subspecialist with a global impact. 
Her scholarly work has made explicit the necessary link between the elimination of health disparities and the attainment of equity in the representation of diversity in the health professions. I know that you guys are probably tired of looking at me, so if you want to put the next slide on and, and show our two speakers, that would be fabulous. Thank you so much. Dr. LaRoque Arena, her influence has stretched across maternal child health and underserved communities, prioritizing equitable care for children across the lifespan, notably in Central Harlem, New York. She served as a board member of the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation from 2013 to 2022, and now leads the organization as the president. Dr. LaRoque Arena is a senior editor for the Leadership in the Intersection of Gender and Race in Healthcare and Science, Case Studies and Tools, bringing together the narrative histories of a diverse group of women in medicine and science. She has had numerous leadership roles including Chief of the Division of General Pediatrics at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, the Endowed Deborah and Leon Black Professor of Pediatrics, Vice Chair of Public Policy and Advocacy, and Chair of the Department of Pediatrics and Vice President of the Maimonides Children's Hospital of Brooklyn. Notably, she served as the seventh president of SUNY Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, where she championed addressing health disparities and oversaw a wide reaching health system. She is now a senior research scientist at the New York Academy of Medicine and professor in epidemiology and pediatrics at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health and the Vallejo's College of Physicians and Surgeons. Among her natural positions, national positions, she is the past president of the American Pediatric Association past board member of the American Academy of Pediatrics and currently the board chair of Vaccinate Your Family. Dr. LaRoque Arena's scholarly work um, spans maternal child health, adolescent health behaviors, injury prevention with a focus on firearm related injuries, mental health integration and global child health. With continuous funding for three decades, she has offered over 120 peer-reviewed papers and edited influential books and series on child health, mental health, and leadership. Do you just feel like, wow, this is amazing. And what an opportunity that we have to be able to chat with both of these fabulous physician leaders, Dr. LaRock Arena, Dr. Nichols, thank you for being here this evening. And I'd like to start out and perhaps by taking off the slide and just putting the three of us up here so that we can interact and ask some questions. That would be fabulous. Thank you. Dr. Nichols and Dr. LaRock Arena, could you please tell us why, with all the skills that you have, why you decided to write your books on leadership? I mean, what, what was the goal? Um, Dr. Nichols, I'll start with you first. Sure. Thank you so much and uh, appreciate those very gracious introductions, Teresa. Uh, I wrote this book on leadership because nobody else did. <laughs> what I found was in all of the organizations that I have been involved in and in the academic settings, physicians need to be leaders and we we are leaders in in our in our work however when we move into the leadership arena in organizations and in health systems uh, that le leadership skill is not fungible and so what i found over and over was physicians were really good at creating a budget, making a proposal, and then they fell flat on their face because they didn't understand principles of communication and persuasion and perspective. So, and the reason I know that so well is because I didn't either. Mm -hmm. So, I've made every mistake in the book and it's in this book to help physicians not have to figure this out the way I did. Much appreciated. Dr. LaRoque Arena. 
Yes, so thank you um, very much, Dr. Nichols, for starting off the conversation. So um, your question is why this book? First of all, a good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you, um, to have a conversation. And I wish I were um, in person with all of you. And I see we have 74 participants. So we are having a conversation about women in medicine, science, and public health. And we focus on in this book, we I focus on informative narratives. And um, as Dr. Nichols noted, it is our informative narrative of um, the journeys that we have traveled. I want to call out the fact that I had three um, um, colleagues who also edited this book with me, uh, Lorraine Germain, Virginia uh, Young, and Rivers Larock Ho. And that in putting this together, the four editors actually in, in, um, invited the narratives of 32 authors. Why is that important? Because I, as an individual, cannot represent the various voices that need to be heard. And we focused on both theory and foundations of leadership and then other areas, leadership redefined. What does it mean to be a leader? Then intersectionality, which I'll come to in a second, implications for the work that most of us are involved in in terms of our academic pursuits. So implications for curricular changes. Because if we are leaders, it is not only because of, the, of representation, it is because our leadership signifies a change, curricular change, a change in the questions we ask in research, and a change in how practice is um, implemented. And so we, the fourth area is tools for organizational learnings. And then epilogue, because this is a continuing conversation, we're not going to solve the problem of the lack of support for leadership by women. And obviously Dr. Nichols is focusing on some of the skill sets. So the book, I wanna focus one, uh, a couple, um, a minute on intersectional issues and sharing these stories. So why, why talk about intersection? Uh, well, because most of us have more than one identity. Yes, a woman, yes, Haitian, yes, African-American, yes, a mother, yes, a grandmother. All these discussions and the learnings from the various uh, health professions, professional departments need to hear those stories. Why? Because our stories have not been included, all right? So it is to give voice to that and to express a purpose in ways that we can convey this information uh, to make a difference. We want to balance our overarching optimism and strength-based approach and contrast that to the lived realities of what it's like to be a leader, either as president, as dean, as division chief, as chair, or in our undefined leadership role. And I know we'll, you'll get to some of those discussions. I was going to read a couple of sections on the book, but I think I'll hold off so we can get to the next point in our discussions. Well, save that because I think the, the <laughs> yeah. narratives were fabulous. So reading a little bit of it, maybe if we have some time at the end would be great. I appreciate that. Thank you. But for both of you, what would you say are the main messages of your books? And, and under what circumstances is your book the most useful? Dr. Nichols? So thank you. I. I think the main message that I want to get across is, and why I, why I really wrote the book was that physicians need to be leaders. And if, and if we're going to do that, we need to be effective leaders. And what I sometimes show is a picture of a ladder and those prime skills that you need of persuasion and conflict management and decision making are the number one rung on that ladder. And if you if you try to skip over that, you're likely to break the rungs and fall back down to the to the bottom of the ladder again, if you follow that metaphor. So so it's so critical. And what I see happening sometimes, why it's so critical is doctors say, then I give up. I'm not going to participate. I will go just do my own thing. And that's that's the worst decision that can be made. We desperately need more physicians in leadership. And I highly agree with Dr. LaRocca Arena's point 
about intersectionality. We need to bring together the, the perspectives that we have, the approaches that we have, and understand what, what is that old line? This is not rocket science, it, but, it, but in many ways, it's more important than that. We need, to, we need to, to take seriously the fact that we must be participants, we must be active, and there are ways to make that happen. There are things that doctors don't like to do, like negotiation. I was in private practice 17 years to tell me that I had to talk to, a, to an insurance company and negotiate what was best for my patient. No way, I would never do that. But in, in leadership situations, if you go in and say, hell no, I'm gonna go and do it my way, you will probably be out on a limb getting nothing done. You have, And it's not just a matter of, well, I guess I'll, just compromise. No, there are ways to approach the negotiations to get to your BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. What will move, move us forward in patient care? It's so important. Thank you. Dr. Um, Morocco? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. Uh, so to, just to repeat it, under what circumstances is the book most useful? Um, I think, first of all, um, awareness, as we know, is part of the cycle of conscious raising, meaning awareness that leads to an analysis that leads to an action and a com an accountability for what we do. So when do we read? Well, we read when moments of quiet, moment of discord, in our teaching roles, in our research, in our reflections about how we practice medicine. And so I think the circumstances that this book is most useful is to understand we're not alone. Oftentimes we face leadership challenges in isolation. We have to break down those silos. We have to talk to each other and create a community of uh, forgive me for the men in the audience, but of sisterhood that actually allows us to support each other. And I could say that I think that sisterhood is equal opportunity. I've been supported as much by men as by women and the reverse, unfortunately. So that I think when we share our narratives and we say, you know, that particular circumstance was uncomfortable. I think you have all heard that silence often is interpreted as complicity, that it's okay. To speak up is important. To share each other's lessons about what's effective, what's not effective. By the way, I agree with Dr. Nichols that in fact, there are certain skill sets and competencies, which we talk about in my book, um, in terms of leadership. But let's recognize that in fact, we all make mistakes. <laughs> it's part of the journey. And so whether or not women are judged differently in the context of universities and academia is a question to be posed. And, you know, you can answer it for yourself. I've answered it for myself. I think it's not a level playing field. And so how do we build those competencies, support each other actively through mentorship, through sponsorship and sharing of stories. So we break down the silos of isolation and say, of course we can lead. And leadership occurs at every single level, every single level from high school students earlier even, okay, to college, to um, medical students, to our public health students who teach us every day what effective teaching is. So we are all leaders, and I know you'll get to that question, Dr. Rohr, um, but we are all leaders and we should claim that, and the way we claim it is to not work in isolation and to build those skill sets so that we are more effective. One other point is why share this? We bring unique perspectives. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that because our lived experience is different, different from each other, but also as a collective, there's a there are similarities in our uh, lived experience that we can apply in an equitable way to how we teach, how we approach human beings and how we care for them and the key questions we ask in our research. 
Well, I'm so glad that you commented too about the isolation that occurs for people in leadership and the need for us to be more cognizant of that. And, and the narratives are fabulous. And Dr. Laurent Karina, you, there's a comment, <laughs> that, a statement that you made um, that I wonder if you could address a little bit more. The statement was, one does not need a little to be a leader. H how is that addressed in your book? What did you mean by that? Um, so the comment of um, one does not need a title to be a leader. Oh, a title. It's a title. Right. It's a title. Yeah, uh, one does not need a title to be a leader. So I am going to take this opportunity to actually quote for a section of the book. I mentioned that one of it is re leadership redefined. You know, if we call something some, maybe we sort of have an affirmation uh, and just say, yeah, you know, I've been told that being a president is, is a leader, being a CEO is a leader, being a chair is a leader. So Dr. Eileen Fenoy, who wrote the chapter, Am I Not a Leader?, says the following, what do you think of when someone says a person is a leader? As I said, president, CEO, she says chairman, I'm reading from the book, et cetera, of an organization. Do you consider yourself not a leader due to the absence of such a title? If your definition of a leader requires a title, then I too am not a leader. She's speaking of herself. But is that the true indication of who a leader is? For example, as a professor of pediatrics in a non-tenured position, so hierarchy, she speaks to hierarchy, right? in a major university health system in New York City and an associate director of my division, would you say I am a leader? So she poses the key question, what does it mean? Is it what you bring as a contribution to solving a particular health issue, right? Is it, and I'm looking at myself and seeing that perhaps I'm looking down, so I'm gonna adjust this a second, okay, forgive me. So I think the key question is that Everyone has the potential to be a leader. And I think we see this in the global wor uh, world where um, uh, women have stood up to uh, political, to regimes that oppress others and say, no, they don't have a title. They walk in the streets and they don't have a title, but they say, no, this is not justice. So I think in, in, in our medical education and in our work, um, it's to reaffirm that we are all leaders and contribute either through our silence or through our active voices. So much. And I think that is incredibly powerful thinking about how we choose uh, leadership as part of the criteria for entrance into medical school. So, and, and that not everything has to be a specific title. So I'm going to have to use that with my pre-med students as they kind of go forward. But um, Dr. Nichols, if I may kind of move over a little, your book discusses specific leadership skills. What are the three categories of skills and which skills or skill are the most important for women physicians? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because I present a lot of uh, presentations on uh, this book and what I really come to hone is there are three categories of those 11 skills. The, there are the skills that you do exactly the same as a physician as you do as a leader. And that's your ethics, and that and that's perspective. As a doctor, I had patients that were uh, American Indians. I had patients that were Eastern European immigrants. That they had very different perspectives. So I got that. The second category, and I I uh, mentioned that earlier, were the things that I didn't really need to uh, be aware of or skilled at in, uh, in, in as a physician, but I really needed to learn how to do it, which were things like the various principles of communication and persuasion and the aspects of perspective that led me to select the, the aspects of persuasion. Decision-making, as a physician, as a general internist, I would 
would appear to be leaping to my, my uh, differential diagnosis, but it was because of years of training and education and experience. But when I became a leader, I was doing that same thing. I was leaping to conclusions without having that background of, of education and experience. So you got to stop and do and pay attention to be sure that you are, are getting to the right decision. Uh, conflict management. I didn't have any clue how to do <clears throat> conflict management. And that's a huge part of winning people over is not just batting, uh, bumping heads together. It's how do I see what they bring to the table and appreciate that and help them see that we really have the same goal. There were so many things. The third category really stopped me in my tracks because it's, it's commun the, mainly it's communication. And I thought that I was really good at communicating with my patients. And what I found when I went in into leadership was I made assumptions about what people were saying, because I knew the words. I'll save you the long story, but I was in Washington, D.C. with a group of other national presidents of other organizations of other healthcare professions. And we were having a major argument. Uh, and at one point, the predominantly nurse-based organization said, well, we're independent, you know. Well, of course, the, all the doctor president organizations of organizations were, no, you're not independent. And we went back and forth for about 15 minutes. And the negotiator, facilitator, what had introduced himself as, as being involved in settling the Mideast peace agreement. And I said, it's too bad they never did anything as difficult as getting doctors and nurses to agree. And that turned out to be the case. But finally, he stopped and he said, what do you mean, nurses, what do you mean by independent? And they said, well, we have independent licenses. When we get an order for a medication, we have to sure it's the right drug, the right dose, the right patient. And so we are independent. You could have heard a pin drop because all of us doctors thought that they meant they wanted to, to push the envelope on scope of practice. So we do that when a patient comes in and says, I'm fatigued. I would never say, well, that means you are anemic and I'm sending you for a blood transfusion. No, of course, I would ask questions and get full clarity on what they were talking about. In leadership, we think we know what the words mean and we jump to conclusions and to go way up the ladder of inference of what they're talking about. And generally we are wrong. So those are the categories of things that I have observed and personally uh, did wrong that, that I have put in my book. Dr. LaRocarina, it looked like you were ready to jump in on that. No, restate the question for me because I want to focus it in a particular way. I said um, the specific leadership skills, the three categories of the skills and which skills are the most important for women physicians. Well, um, I want to sort of shift the discussion a little bit to say one is most of us, um, by the time we become physicians, licensed physicians and practice, that we understand this is a personal responsibility to attain certain competence. I wanna shift the discussion, however, to organizational justice with respect to the diversity of that leadership or that representation in academia, but in particular, all right, is that there is a dual responsibility. I am responsible for making sure that I have the skill set, the content knowledge of my discipline, the communication skills, the respect for other individuals to hear their perspective and alternative opportunities, alternative strategies. 
those are some of the skill sets that Dr. Nichols is pointing to. What I say in terms of the, the narratives that I heard from the 32 authors is there is um, likewise an organizational responsibility and accountability to create the environment that allows me, although I'll claim it even if I'm not allowed, that allows me to contribute maximally to the health of populations and to the health of individuals. So that the conversation to say personal responsibility to have the competence, absolutely. And let's get those skills and those competencies, which means, for example, to take it at an individual level. What are our biases when we approach others? Do we have implicit biases? Do we engage in microaggressions? What is that interpersonal, right? Or is there, is there distributive leadership that acknowledges others, that says, you know, my perspective of the world may not be the only one. How do I respect others and bring it to bear? Which is what some of Dr. Nich what Dr. Nichols is saying. But an organization at the very top has the responsibility to create the environment that respects that process. And so the reason for the book, I wanna go back to your first question, why write this book? Because in fact, those stories have not been told. Stories of injustice. Now I'm strength-based, I'm an optimist forever, but I do recognize that our systems are not only imperfect, but they have institutionalized processes that have disadvantaged particular individuals. Now I don't internalize that disadvantage. I just don't. But it has an impact on who's who sits at the table for the admissions committee, who sits at the executive leadership, the C-suite. We know that because we know in medicine now at the rung of assistant professor, right? Women outnumber, right? In medical schools, women outnumber men. And yet there is a pyramid, right? So at the very top, I want to pay homage to a colleague of mine, Valerie Montgomery Rice, who's a narrative I'm going to read from, um, who, when I became president at SUNY Upstate, she sent me an orchid to say, yes, sister, I'm with you. And let's share. Let's not work in isolation. Let's share our experiences. Let's share our skill sets. Okay. Understand what the risks are. The other thing is, you know, I think we've said it in different ways, but yes, I was accused of being mission driven. I had one purpose. It was to make the lives of individuals, families, and communities better through my science. That is my purpose. And I should be held accountable for that purpose. But so, so should institutions within the ecosystem of the United States and the ecosystem of a higher education. We are all accountable for that leadership. So that's what the book talks about, the different experiences of women in you know various um, sort of um, trajectories of leadership that we would sort of label leadership. But let's share those narratives and let's understand that we are part of a larger system that may not always be fair. <laughs> and we must change that. Well, we greatly appreciate those stories because I think not only does the story impact our understanding, but it personally, the humbleness in which you describe the stories and tell about some of the, not really mistakes, but just stumbles along the way, it helps us all to understand that that is not the, the exception, but sort of the expectation that the stumbles just make us stronger and better. So thank you for bringing that up. And Dr. LaRock, you, you mentioned that you had a couple of narratives um, that you wanted to share. Could you yeah. tell us briefly two or three of these leadership case studies? Yeah, sure. I have two that I'd like to point out. One is from, um, I want to go back to who my uh, co-editors are. Uh, Lauren Germain um, is a psychologist who is very much involved in the evaluation of uh, educational efforts. Virginia Young is a librarian who had a wealth of knowledge in terms of the literature. And Rivers Larock Ho is a recent graduate from undergraduate liberal studies and gender studies. And I want to read first from uh, Valerie Montgomery Rice's, uh, she was one of the key informants that I interviewed 
uh, for the chapter on organizational change, which focused on organizational justice. And to tell you the impact, even at the highest level of racism, sexism, and all the other isms that we talk about. Okay, and she says the following, and it's a quote, quote, and we were opening the Center for Women's Health Research, which I was so excited about. I came home one day, and my husband said to me, quote, you seem happy, you seem less stressed, even though I was 10 times busier than I had ever been. She responded, quote, you know what? She responded to her husband, you know what? I am getting to work every day and race is not the issue. I can go into an environment, I can throw out an idea and I don't have to worry about whether or not somebody is critiquing or criticizing or questioning my idea because I am black. This is not the high, I want to, you know, Valerie Montgomery Rice is currently president and CEO of Morehouse. There are many other stories, narrative stories of women in science and leadership positions who are still facing the kinds of repressive acts that she shares. So in order to contribute fully as human beings, part of the human family, then those barriers must be dismantled, okay? The other one is one that's familiar, unfortunately, to, to women, not exclusively women, because that bias, whether you're cis or um, a transgender woman, um, those experiences, unfortunately, are too prevalent. And this one comes from Rivers Laroque Ho on sex as violence. I'm sorry to get kind of serious in these conversations, but it is the reality. She says, and I, I quote from that section just a little bit, the threat of, quote, in parentheses, sexual violence is always present with me in public. She has identified herself in the uh, narrative biography as a non-binary, which we know we're much more sensitive now in pronouns, in things that perhaps 20 years ago, we didn't have the language. She goes on, this is true for all women, multiplied uh, differently, and again for Black women, trans women, disabled women, Indigenous women, Asian women, lesbians, and you can continue that list. Ambiguously raced, ambiguously gendered. I never quite know where I stand, but I still get read as a woman all the time. Even in my parka, with all the betraying and defining features of my body, insulated from outside eyes. And there are other stories that say that, you know, this experience of our personal lives and how it melts into our professional lives and uh, the respect that is due each of us within our profession to practice, to be researchers, to be in the lab, to be in the community. Those things, the conversation we are having in leadership, and women in medicine and science and public health are essential to dismantling the system that would not allow that contribution. So I really um, think it's an important, and again, the specific skill set, the competencies that Dr. Nichols talks about are critically important. How to negotiate, right? I had somebody who came to me and said, you negotiated a reason, this was when I was well, one of my institutions where I learned that you don't say, oh, don't pay me much because I love the work. No, I love the work. I will put in the tens of hours that pay me equitably, okay? That is part of organizational justice, okay? Recognize my contributions and attribute that so that I get promoted to professor. That pyramid that we talked about, professor, very tip, very few. Leadership president, you know, Dean, very few. So that's the conversation that we, I, I hope we continue to have. So appreciated and thank you for those stories. Now, I wanna let our audience know that we have a, a few minutes for questions, answers, um, perhaps even some comments. So feel free to put it into the Q&A and I can then bring those forward. But for, for both of you, maybe we'll start with Dr. <laughs> you, Nichols. I mean, with you, Dr. Nichols, how do you shape your leadership around the pushback from your male counterparts, even if that pushback is not um, obvious? So 
I'm I'm so glad you asked that. And and Dr. LaRock Arena, you get me so jazzed up. You are so <laughs> inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. When I just have to say, when I went into practice at in private practice, only 15% of all of the people licensed to practice by either degree in the United States were women. And I thought that the the if as we increase the numbers and the percentage that that the challenges of being in leadership would would even out and boy was i wrong that that has not happened and and i've thought a lot about it i've researched it um and and some of it has to do with our our approaches, and I'm not talking about DISC and Myers-Briggs, but um, the male approach is classified as agentic. The female approach is classified as communal. The little boys know who's the best be baseball player, who's the best basketball player, and they have hierarchy, but they all go to get ice cream afterwards. The little girls have to have everything at a level playing field and heaven forbid somebody annoys somebody else and they won't talk to him for a, a year. And there are lots, of, there's a lot of research out there that, that references some of those sex differences. In fact, there's a study that showed for a conference in order to get 50% of the questions to come from women attending the conference, that there had to be an attendance of 80% women at the conference before there were 50% of the questions coming from women. I don't, I don't have an answer for that, but I would, but my approach was always, I'm good at what I do. I work very hard. I was the first woman in every entity I've ever been in and frequently the only one. And they said, well, you're going to have to talk, work twice as hard as the guys, which I didn't find to be that difficult. So I, I became the leader I, because I would do the work. I would put, I would put the, the, what it what was required to be successful and my approach was and I realize this is just me talking but my approach was if you don't want me to do this I got plenty of other things that I am really good at that I will go that I will go do I mean I became chief of staff of the hospital in three years now probably nobody else wanted to do the work that it took to be <laughs> chief of staff in the hospital but but they reelected me because I put in the time and I did the work and they, they saw that. Now, that's not the whole answer in any way, shape or form. Dr. LaRock Arena has given us examples and, and it's absolutely true uh, that there are, there's, there are many areas that stop us, many, um, men and sometimes women that stop us in our advancement um and uh i won't i won't shut up or or um step away i will continue to make my point in a careful thoughtful persuasive uh communicative way but i'm not giving up and, and that's not always enough. I agree, but I totally agree with Dr. LaRock Arena. The institutions have to step up and reinforce that and make it, make it um, possible for the various, it's not just women, it, for the, 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 the various types of, of experiences that we bring to be recognized, and that's that's on us as leaders. We have to do the same thing. I just wrote about the the principles of case. C. You need champions. 
A, you need advocates. S, you need supporters. E, you need endorsers. People did it for me. I do it for other people. Thank you, Shamal. It's powerful, powerful words. And definitely agree that we need to have institutionals take charge as well. But Dr. LaRoccarina, I think you might be very um, appropriate in answering this, this question. For underrepresented minority women physician leaders, how do you do the same pushback that, how do you get around that pushback that comes from majority predominantly represented physicians? Well, I, I, again, um, I think that there, there are several levels here. One, uh, I'll give you an example. The first national committee that I attended which has an injury prevention, uh, someone um, um, categorized me as the, being from the community. Um, I fully support the community, really um, um, endorse community-based participatory research. It was what I did. But in fact, I understood that as um, not accepting me as a scientist. That yes, of course, I believe in, in the community voice, but to categorize me based on what I think were his assumptions or the bias. Um, what I did with that encounter is, um, it's hard for me to be impolite. So I did not say something back to him, but we were in the hallway and I engaged in conversation and said, you know, I understood your comment, but I wanted tell you about my interest or what I see as the epidemiology of injuries and why this is important to me as a physician. I think that person was entirely surprised that I actually responded. Now, my response may be more vigorous if it was truly <laughs> An absolute insult there, I might have responded on the spot. But what I'm saying is that um, we should engage with each other in ways that improve communication, that define, if someone seeks to define us, let's define ourselves, okay? Let's, um, let's debunk some myths. It's one of the chapters that Carol Berkowitz wrote, a debunking myths. Okay, so the myth may be that as an African American woman that I come to a meeting, then what I, all I can speak about is the community perspective. No, well, you know, did you know I was a chemist? Did you know that my first published research one was on calcium status and lead poisoning? What are your assumptions? The other is one that is tougher, which is that folks may react because they feel that my presence or somebody else's presence is going to substitute them. So, you know, it's been written about in terms of zero sum game. If you, if I gain, you lose. I think we have to change the discussion to say, how do we as a community of physicians, of scientists, public health folks contribute so that we all gain because in fact, our mission to serve through those various things, whether it's in a lab in the community, that that is enhanced by our diversity of, oh, and Valerie Montgomery Rice mentioned it in her talk, cognitive diversity. We bring that to bear and it's not a zero sum game, okay? I wanna bring out one other point to make sure we don't neglect this. Yeah, women are not men, big surprise, right? I gave birth. And I'm talking about birthing individuals now to be to be respectful of my colleagues who have a different life experience from mine. But the structures, structures, structural issues, um, uh, um, structures are modifiable. What is just about when I was an intern, I worked 110, 120 hours. That's not even safe. So let's not endorse systems that are unsafe and in fact perpetuate a kind of organizational structure that is not even fair. It's not fair to men, it's not fair to women. How do we integrate our own personal family lives? Do we have parental leave? Do we have, men benefit by the way, in terms of the advances that women have brought into medicine. Do we have parental leave? My husband had to be on call within 24 hours of our son's birth. 
not only was that not great for me, it was definitely not great for him. So that we need to change the structures that build in disadvantage, that build in injustices that actually affect all of us. So that, that and that's the beginning of the narrative of why, and by the way, when we say, how do your leadership push back from male counterparts, engage. Give me a discussion. Even if somebody insults me, I'd like to, after I, I pause and I'm a little surprised sometimes about meanness, you know, I've not, I've not adjusted to meanness. Okay. After I sort of recover from that, then let's challenge with good conversation. Let's not resort to violence. Let's not resort to demeaning other people and call it out. The bystander, we have some research on bystander interventions. Let's not stand by when others are disrespected. Okay, let's not do that. So I think there are many things that, um, by the way, I said before, I have been supported as much by men as by women. I've been more disappointed when women haven't supported me, <laughs> maybe because I believe in us. But um, I think we can push back in many ways that are respectful, and there are situations, though, that are dangerous for women. I spoke to one in terms of sexist violence, which is predominant in many different spheres for attorneys, physicians, nurses, others in other jobs. We cannot accept that. We cannot. And we need to speak out about that when it occurs. And there has been some movement towards that. One of the chapters, two of the chapters, actually, by Lorraine Germain, uh, talks about that, going beyond Title IX. How do we change this? How do we not have it just in terms of written document or you, you do, I just did my uh, certification for sexual harassment training. Well, let's put it to action, okay? And actually hold institutions accountable or complicit for lack of action on those terms. So there are many things. Strong words, strong words. Well, we're getting to the end of our discussion, and I know a lot of you still had some questions. I'd say get the books because it sounds like there's some fabulous information in there, especially with some of the narratives and especially with some of the specific ideas. Dr. Nichols, I wanted to give you kind of a final word. Do you have a, a final word or a message for women in medicine and science that you would share? Two things. Two. Okay. Uh, briefly, <laughs> you will regret what you don't do more than you regret what you do do. And when I went bungee jumping in New Zealand, I tried to prove <laughs> that to be true. And be bold, be bold, take the risk, take the situation and go with it. Don't take the safe way just because you're afraid, be bold. Those are my two suggestions. Thank you so much. Well, I, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Sandu, our host, and appreciate all the information and the discussion. I look forward to having more discussion as the year goes on. Dr. Sandu. Thank you, Dr. Rockridge Greber. Wow. What amazing energy in this virtual room. Um, I just can't even, can't even think of the words, but such a big thank you to both of our amazing um, speakers this evening, Dr. Laura Karina and Dr. Nichols. Um, this concludes our program this evening in the celebration of Women in Medicine Month. And I want to encourage you and kind of echo Dr. Rourke Kirchgraber's words, go get the books. Super impactful, <laughs> brilliant women, amazing experience. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your expertise, your viewpoints on these very important topics. We're proud to have created this collaborative partnership and hope you'll visit both the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation website as well as the AMO website. I believe the URLs have been put up in the chat for us. And um, please learn more about both organizations. You can subscribe to the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation right on their page. And you can also become an AMO member through um, our page. You can also scan the QR codes. I believe they're right on the screen for you um, for a couple of upcoming events. Um, that promise to be exciting. On October 26th at four o'clock Eastern, the Women in Medicine Legacy Foundation is going to host the Alma Dea Morani MD Renaissance Woman Award presentation featuring this year's awardee, Dr. Nanette Wenger, 
who is an esteemed leader with over 50 years of impact in the field of cardiology. Mark your calendar and plan to join us for that Zoom event. AMWA has events all month that will add to your career really throughout the year. Check them out at our website. Um, and your guest star organizations really truly are impactful. They directly provide important programming like this, lecture to our communities and other really important programming and initiatives. We're so grateful for your support. In closing, I wish to thank all of you for attending our program to honor women in medicine and another big thank you to Dr. Laraka Reina and Dr. Nichols. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Delightful. Till the next time. This time next year. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I appreciate it.